take the opportunity to welcome Dr. David McKenzie, who is um, originally from the land of hobbits. Um, he's been following the New Zealand, and uh, he's, uh, uh, David has uh, done a lot of things all over the world. He did his PhD at Yale University. He went out to teach at Stanford, and now he's at the World Bank. He's the lead economist at the World Bank in the Development Research Group, and uh, he's a prolific researcher. 80 publications in really good journals. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we brought him out here to, to work closely with our faculty, especially economics faculty. So he is here to give a talk on one of the topics that he's worked on extensively, uh, on migration. So uh, without further ado, Dr. David McKenzie. Great, thank you. So, uh, so I, I'm going to talk today about a subject which is probably uh, very hot here, which is this issue of migrant rights, and I'm going to talk about this sort of temporary migration and what we know about the development impacts of temporary migration and whether there's a trade-off between the opportunities we provide to migrants and the rights we give to them. So just sort of by way of motivation, there's this uh, very nice new book that just came out in the last week by Martin Roos, who's at Oxford, called The Price of Rights. And, and it, um, he has this graph here which looks at the major um, human rights treaties that the UN has passed and you can see um, again, you, these screens don't have the point, oh yeah, they do the point it does. Anyway, you can see the, my arrow here showing you that the, the Migrant Rights Treaty has been uh, the one that's been least ratified of all the human rights treaties uh, that there are. And what does this uh, Migrant Rights, uh, Migrant Workers uh, Treaty say should be the rights of workers according to the UN? There's, there's, a, there's a whole list of these rights and so some of them are things that uh, you know, being free from forced labor, being uh, able to, to not have your identity documents confiscated, things that are sort of less economic rights, and then there's also things that are more economic rights in terms of rights to equal treatment with native workers in terms of, of salaries and things, rights to the same access um, to, as nationals to education and housing, rights to choose freely paid work after five years of residence, right to equal treatment um, with citizens in, in case of uh, um, other things. And so you can see there's, there's a large number of rights under this human rights treaty that, that migrants in a lot of places do not have. And you know, we see something similar from, from the ILO which has a number of conventions on human rights and you can see that the, the two conventions on migrant rights are the least ratified of any of the, the different treaties and the, the countries that have tended to ratify them uh, the, are all sort of sending countries. So um, you, you might see Ghana um, ratify, or Mexico ratifying these, these uh, treaties on human rights, but you'll never see the US or, or Qatar um, doing it. And so the, the question is, you know, what does, what does this mean? Well, you know, we see in the paper, uh, you know, big, big stories that, that w these lack of rights is really a big problem for workers. So we see this in the, in the region, uh, especially with the uh, World Cup coming up, this is focus here. You see this in the UAE, building towers, cheating workers, sort of stories of exploitation uh, of migrants in the, in the UAE. And you know, if we look around the world, it's true that, that again, this is from, from Mount Nerus, that the migrants in the GCC have far fewer rights than migrants in any other region of the world, and especially when it comes to, to some of these other rights, the residence rights, political rights, family rights, and things. And so the, um, so the question is, you know, what, what does this mean? Is, is this a bad thing? Is this, are there some trade-offs here? And before I, I get um, started about talking about the, these implications of rights, just want to also point out, well, it's true the GCC is, is the place where the rights of migrants are at least uh, in terms of these objective data. Uh, you know, if you look even in my country in New Zealand, you, you can find articles like this about the RSC, which is a seasonal worker program I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about. The RSC is seen by the I ILO, who are no slackers on rights. The ILO is, is sort of a gold standard, um, very good migrant worker program that should be em you know, emulated by other countries and yet you can still sort of find things saying this is brutal racist oppression, it's uh, uh, you know, any efforts to try and relax the minimum wage that New Zealanders get for these migrants are, are, are terrible, unscrupulous, uh, 
you know, you can, you can, this is abuse, et cetera. And so, you know, there really is a lot of concern that not, that, that somehow, you know, not giving migrants the same rights as native workers and, and some of these, you know, rights in terms of minimum wages and things is, is really exploitation and we should really be concerned about it. So what I want to do today is talk about two things which relate to each other in that um, effect. So the first thing is, you know, given these concerns about temporary worker programs, about exploitation, about workers getting tricked, about, you know, all these, these poor conditions that migrant workers face, what do we know about their development impacts? And so I'll talk about three different ways that we might think about the development impact of migration and what some evidence is from different parts of the world on each of those. And then I'll talk about, well, is there a trade-off between the size of that impact, how good it is for each individual worker, and the number of people that actually get to benefit from that. So is there this sort of rights versus opportunities trade-off? And most of the, the evidence that I'll speak to on that comes from Filipino migrants who go everywhere in the world. So some come to the Gulf, some go to Hong Kong, some come to Malaysia, some come to the US. And so we'll talk about um, how we might use some of that Filipino data to look at this. And then finally, I'll, I'll conclude in terms of you know, development implications of different types of rights. So not all rights are the same. And we might think of income-based protection versus non-income-based rights protection and how each of them affect how much people stand to gain from temporary migration. So to start with, let's, let's just sort of talk about what do we know? Do these temporary migration programs that we've seen all these stories about in the newspaper decrying you know, the exploitation of workers, do they really improve development outcomes? And so, you know, this is a difficult question to answer because we really want to know what would have happened if this person hadn't migrated. And so it's not enough just to look at somebody who comes from a poor country and look and say, you know, they're not very well paid. They, they seem to let, you know, they're working hard days here under the hot sun. You know, clearly things can't be so good. We need to know what would have happened to them if they hadn't moved here. And, you know, that's, that, that's very difficult for several reasons. It's difficult because we don't have data typically on migrants before and after migration. And so we can't track the same person over time in many cases. And then even if we could, their life might have changed for reasons that have nothing to do with migration. And so, you know, if we look at people that stay behind in India and India just starts booming, then, you know, if we compare them to Indians who come to Qatar, then, you know, the right comparison should not be what was this person doing 10 years ago in India before they started coming to Qatar, but what would they have been doing today had they stayed behind in India. And so we need to think about that. And then the other thing is, is migrants self-select. Migrants are special. You know, only 3% uh, of the world's population lives outside their country of birth. Even if you look at the Philippines, you know, a country that's really well known for its migration, we see that uh, you know, less than 5% of the Philippines labor force is outside of the Philippines at, at any given time. So 95% of the people in the Philippines are choosing or not able to migrate abroad, and there's no reason to think they should be very similar to the people who are able to migrate abroad. And so if we just compare people who migrate and people who don't migrate, there's going to be bias. So people have used different approaches to try and get around this problem. So the ideal approach is one that I've managed to use in a couple of studies of permanent migration, which is to use migration lotteries. So New Zealand runs a couple of lottery programs, just like the US Green Card Lottery, where people can apply from the Pacific Islands, many more people apply than are allowed to come in, so they just have, have a draw. And so it used to be a televised draw where they'd say, okay, uh, you get to come to New Zealand today, uh, congratulations. And so they'd pull them all out of a barrel, now our computer does it, but you know, we could compare people who were chosen to, by the computer to migrate to people who were chosen by the computer to stay behind and, and use that as a comparison. The, the sort of approaches that have, have been used with temporary migration are a number of sort of econometric approaches that, that try and approximate this lottery. And so uh, one approach that Michael Clemens and Owen Tiangston have done is look at Filipino workers who are trying to go to Korea, and what they have there is a test that's a language test, and you have to score 120 out of 200. And so they look and they say, well, the person that gets 119 out of 200 and the person that gets 121 out of 200 they're, they're very similar to each other, and the difference is, is, you know, one made a small mistake on a test. It's not going to be um, very much, and so they compare people just in above and below that score to get this, this com nice comparison group. 
What we do in um, some work in Tonga and Vanuatu is we know New Zealand set up this new seasonal worker program. We know how they're, they're recruiting people and what the characteristics of workers that they're looking for are. And then we can go out to villages where they're just starting to recruit and get people who just got the chance now and match them to very similar people who might get a chance later but haven't got to, to move yet. And then we follow them up over um, four waves of data over two years and, and can sort of try and compare there. The, the sort of only work that I know that does anything like this for the Gulf area is some work that is very recent by Michael Clements that looks at Indian construction workers who are going to Dubai. And so all these people had contracts to go to Dubai when the financial crisis hit. Some of them had those contracts cancelled because the construction companies you know, suddenly couldn't finance the, the construction that were, they were going to be doing. And so some of those Indians had to stay behind. Some who had just been hired two months before had already got to come. And so they can compare those groups. And so again, in all these cases, the idea is to try and get a counterfactual, somebody who's very similar to the ones that, that migrate. So then if we want to look at development impact, we can use these different approaches and say, does temporary migration help? And so what do we mean by help? What do we mean by development? Well, you know, one very crude definition of development is anything that raises people's incomes. And so, you know, if that's the case, then we, sh we should, you know, really expect to see migration being very important for development given the huge wage differentials between places like Qatar and the US and places like Sri Lanka, or India, Philippines, or Tonga. And so, you know, if, if we look and we can see you can end 10 times as much in one country as another, we, we should really expect there to be positive development impacts. Although the, this contrary view that, that we've pointed out is that these workers are somehow just paid so badly, they're close to slavery, they go into all this debt to come and migrate, and we should really not expect them to be, to be better off. And so what does the data say? Well, if we look at these seasonal workers coming to New Zealand to work on vineyards, to work in, in farms, then you know, their income goes up 35% as a result of participating in this program. And, and their consumption goes up by a little bit less because people are saving and investing as well. We look at these Filipino workers going to Korea, there's 30 to 60% increases in household expenditure. And if we look at these Indian workers going to Dubai, their daily wage goes up by a factor of five compared to what they would be earning back in India. And so you know, these are massive increases in, in income, far bigger than any other development program that we, we typically think of. But you might say, well, you know, it, development's not all about money. Development's also about, um, you know, really in economist terms, it's about ut maximizing utility. And your utility function has income in it, but it also has other things in it. And, you know, leaving your family behind is hard. Working under 50 degree sun is hard. Uh, you know, being separated is, is hard. And so how might we think about this? And so, you know, the, the simple economics 101 approach would be to say, let's use revealed preference. People choose to migrate as long as they're well informed in doing so. They, you know, people are making that decision and they're saying the, the cost of migrating are less than the benefits. And so the, the very fact that I migrated tells you that I expect it to be better off. And as long as I'm not wrong in those expectations on average, then migration should be good on average. The other approach that people do is try and look at some of these social costs and try and measure, well, you know, what are, how bad are these things? You know, are children really worse off if their parents are migrating? Is there more divorce, etc.? You know, what you tend to find is that, you know, people who aren't getting along very well with their spouses tend to be more willing to want to go and migrate. So then, you know, you see that there's more divorce amongst migrant families, but it's just that, you know, I don't like my wife, so I, I, I go abroad, right? No, I'm, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> um, so then the, you know, the final thing people can do is look at what's called non-monetary measures of well-being. And so uh, you know, a typical approach here, this is the sort of happiness literature or ladder of life literature. You might ask somebody, you know, consider a ladder where the best possible life is the top rung of the ladder, the worst possible life is on the bottom rung. You know, which, la which rung of the ladder you are on today, where do you expect to be in the future? And you sort of try and therefore people are thinking about you know, a, a more comprehensive view of well-being than just their income. So we don't have very many studies that look at this, but you know, when we do this with these seasonal workers to New Zealand, we find the same sort of rises in subjective well-being as we find in income. So about half a standard deviation increase in subjective well-being. We find a few anecdotal cases of divorce, but very rare, so rare that we, we can't really get any econometric evidence on it. 
Um, when we look at the Indian construction workers in, in Michael Clement's work, he finds you know, this idea that, that households are really misinformed and that they think that they're going to be earning a lot more or that the conditions will be a lot better than they are, not to hold up in, in this case here that the Indian workers uh, tend to have sort of about the right level of wage expectations when they're asked to sort of grade how difficult life's going to be in, in terms of different living conditions. The migrants and the non-migrants um, have very similar sort of rankings. It's not that, that migra migrants sort of find ex post that on average these things are, are much worse. Again, you know, you can find anecdotes of some people who have, you know, been surprised or, or been tricked or, or things, but on average the case is, is not that, that people are systematically being tricked here. So then, you know, the third, third sort of thing is people say, well, it's very fine, you know, these migrants are, are getting higher incomes, they're, they're happier, but it's not really development unless it's doing something for their countries and for the long term. And so, I, you know, it's not enough for us to see these short term increases, we want to see that households are somehow investing this money, that these remittances are not getting wasted on consumption somehow, um, and, and that there's spillover impacts on their, their communities. And so, you know, I don't really subscribe to this view, I think that you know, even temporary increases in, in income are good. And I also think that, you know, that there's this misleading view that, that this temporary migration is not a sustainable way of, uh, of uh, you know, sustaining your family for a while. And so if you think about a lot of the workers coming here, they're on two-year contracts. They're not coming just for one two-year contract. They can do, you know, multiple contracts. You can go again and again. And so, you know, the most productive thing for you if you live in a small rural village in India might not be to, you know, go and set up um, a taxi stand or try and set up a small business in your rural village with hardly any customers who, you know, don't really want to support your business. You, it might be to, to keep on coming back to, the, to, to take advantage of these much higher incomes abroad for many years at a time. So you see this in the Philippines where you get 20 years of migration on two-year contracts. And so it really the household does have a long-term productive opportunity. Their productive long-term opportunity is sustained migration. And so, um, no, but, but, but even if we, we sort of don't take that into account and we just look at, you know, people who come in their first two years of contracts, are they doing things that are not just spending the money on, on sustaining their households, which is a good thing. Um, also, you know, we, we do find some evidence of that. So in, in the Tonga and Vanuatu cases, you see households improving their house, housing. They're more likely to have bank accounts. They build up their ownership of consumer durables. Their kids are more likely to go into secondary schools. We don't see them setting up businesses. They're in Tonga, 100,000 people. They go into a little tiny village. There's, you know, it's not much point selling, setting up a big uh, retail store. There's, there's nobody who wants to buy stuff. So, you know, we don't see that. We don't see so much in terms of contributions to community of public goods. But when you put it all together for these small countries in particular, these, these macro gains are pretty important. So, you know, the New Zealand allowing a, a, a few thousand workers in from, from Tonga and Vanuatu is having equivalent sort of macro impacts to, to a, about a quarter of their annual aid and sort of about a quarter of their, their earnings. And this is just sort of for a few thousand workers coming in. When we look at these Filipino migrants to Korea, again, you don't see much on the entrepreneurial activity, but you do see increases in health and education spending, and, and uh, especially you know, kids going to private school. So you know, there's a lot more evidence for, for migration, temporary migration supporting investments in human capital than for supporting investments in entrepreneurial activities. So you know, if we look at what we know about development interventions, you know, here's some graphs of what the impact is in per capita income of some of the most famous types of interventions. Microfinance, really nobody finds any impact. That's why it's a zero here. Conditional cash transfers, these are the darling of the, the aid world. Progressor in Mexico is world famous. You know, it tends to raise people's incomes by about 15 US dollars a year. And that's, you know, the government hanging out, handing out a bunch of money. In, in uh, <coughs> Nicaragua, it's the same thing. The government hands out a bunch of money and people's incomes go up a bit. We gave um, you know, grants to microenterprises in Sri Lanka, you, you know, we find when we give it to a woman, we don't get anything, but when we give it to men, we get a sustained increase in their business profits. But, you know, let's now suddenly put migration into this picture. The seasonal migration to New Zealand is, is uh, you know, having far more impact than any of these other things. 
And then if we add you know, the option of permanent migration, it's, it's, it's far larger. So you know, migration just swamps any other development intervention we know of. It's just, just so much more powerful in terms of raising people's incomes than any of these other things that people spend so much more time talking about. So then the question is, you know, is there a trade-off? Is there a trade-off between how much gain we can give to particular people and the number of people that, that get to benefit from this and, and you know, how to write come into this conversation. So, you know, the big puzzle is given these enormous gains, so few people in the world migrate. And if you ask them, a lot of people say they'd like to migrate. So this is from the Gallup World Poll, when you ask people if they'd like to permanently migrate, and, and you know, a lot more people say they'd like to temporarily migrate. So, you know, if I say, would you like to go and live in another country for a few years? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Would you like to permanently leave your country and never come back again? We still find 16% of the world's population saying, yeah, if, if, you give, if you give me that chance, I would love to take it. And you can see it's, you know, really Africa and the Middle East is where that's, uh, you know, really the, the strongest over a third of people want to, to migrate, you know, 700 million people worldwide are saying, I would love to be able to migrate, but I'm, I'm not able to. So, you know, how should we think about this? Well, here's a sort of model that clearly doesn't apply, but this is sort of our standard economics model of how a market might clear, where we have, you know, wages in different countries, we have quantities of, of people wanting to work, and so, you know, the wages that people should get paid in different countries should get determined by supply and demand. And if I find that you can earn a lot more in Canada than you can in the Philippines, it must be because it's really awful to, to work in Canada. And so then you have to pay me more to deal with the cold. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is kind of a crazy model. And if we see that you're paid more than Canada and Saudi Arabia, then I must like the hot more than the, the cold. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's the case. And, you know, in this model, everybody who wants a job can get one and then the wages are just going to, to, to equilibrium. The reason why I'm talking about such an obviously untrue model is just for what it would predict when we think about you know, how will countries respond to getting more income in those countries. So when Dubai starts booming, what would happen under this model? Under this model, Dubai is going to demand more migrants and that's just going to be a shift of the demand curve up the supply curve. We'll get more people coming to Dubai and them getting paid higher wages. Okay, so we just want to have this as sort of a benchmark to compare other models of the world to. So model two of the world is one where there's binding minimum wages, where you say, you know, there's a wage, $400 a month, that a Filipino domestic helper must get paid and um, even if she wants to work for less than that, she's not allowed to. Okay, so, the, so under this model of the world, we have the, the demand for Filipino workers in a particular country, depending on you know, what the GDP of that country is, is here, and all the Filipino workers who'd like to, to, to work abroad are here, and so you've got this gap here. Supply exceeds demand at, the, at this 400 wage. There's many more people who would like to work abroad for $400 a month than are able to, to do so. So then what happens when, when Dubai booms or when, when Qatar booms, we should see there's a, a shift out in the demand curve, but wages aren't going to change at all. All the change, all the change is going to be through quantities. Okay, so in this model of the world, wages of migrants don't change very much, but the quantities of migrants change a lot depending on how the economy is, is going. Sort of, so th this is a distortion in the labor market that's caused by minimum wages. The other sort of distortion you might think of is one caused by quotas. So the US says, for example, H-1B workers, who are the high-tech workers, we have a limit of 65,000 that are allowed to come in. So you know, if you want to bring in Indians and, and uh, Chinese to work in, in the tech sector, there's only 65,000 people that can come in. And so there's this, this quota here, 65,000. And what's going to happen to the wages here? Well, now if the US starts booming, and more firms are wanting to hire these workers, there's still the same quota, and so what's going to hap have to happen, all the adjustments going to have to happen through wages. Okay, so we want to contrast these two views of the world, one where the main distortions are sort of nu numerical distortions, where we say you can only hire so many workers, and one where the main distortions are wage distortions, you can only pay workers so much. And we want to see what happens when countries, 
uh, economies change to see, you know, is all the movement really through wages? Is it through quantities or is it through both? So which of these three views of the world really matches reality best? So, you know, as a precursor to, to empirical work, here's what we see in the, in the papers when, when, these, when there's these recent crises. We see, you know, crisis leaves Dubai workers out in the cold. These Asian workers are all losing their jobs. Not Asian workers' salaries have suddenly got cut dramatically because because Dubai is, is, is not doing very well, they're all losing their jobs. In Albania, there's no, everybody's losing their jobs because of the crisis in Europe. So, you know, in the newspaper we're seeing, it's really all about quantities. It's all about numbers. Less people get to migrate when economies do badly, not, hey, the migrants are all getting paid suddenly a lot less, less money when this crisis has come. So, to look at this more systematically, we got data from the Philippines, this remarkable data set. So the Philippines, everybody who goes um, to migrate from the Philippines has to go through this um, processing center. They get issued these temporary um, what, the contracts. And so we got data on every single contract that the Philippines had, entered, had issued for new workers going abroad. And so that contract has the, the name, the birth date, the gender, the, the civil status, and importantly for us, the destination and the salary of those workers. And so we can look and say, okay, and we, and we also have the type of um, occupation. So we can look and say, okay, here's a um, domestic helper who's going to Saudi Arabia in 2008, and this is how much she's getting paid. And then we can look and see, you know, as, as Saudi Arabia changes in its GDP over time, how do the wages um, change and how do the salaries change? So what do we find? We find that a 1% increase in GDP at destination leads to a 1.5% increase in the Filipino migrants going there, but no change in the wages that they're paid. Okay, so when, when Qatar or Saudi Arabia s starts getting more money, they bring in more workers, but they don't pay them anymore. When, they, when Dubai or, or um, France start having a crisis, they get less workers, but they don't pay them any less. Okay, so, so this is consistent with the model I put up of binding minimum wages. Okay, it seems like the real distortion here is that workers, uh, there's this floor on how much you're allowed to pay, pay workers, and that puts all the adjustment onto quantities. It makes migration a, a much more unstable business than it could otherwise be, because you're having to, to really you know, cut back on the numbers, um, but it's, it's meaning that those who do get to migrate can experience large increases in their wage when they do so because that wage is well above the market clearing wage. So as a specific example, we looked at what happened in the Philippines when in 2006 they, they introduced this domestic helpers bill that doubled the minimum wage that they'd let Filipinos go abroad to work for. Okay, so there was a minimum wage of, of $200 per month that they had said we won't let people go abroad for and they doubled that to $400 and there's a number of countries where Filipino domestic helpers were getting paid less than, um, that, than $400 a month, mostly, mostly around $200 a month, and a lot of Gulf countries in here. I don't have Qatar because we didn't have good GDP data for Qatar when we were doing this exercise. Um, so Qatar is, is not in here, but you can see the UAE is and, and uh, um, Saudi Arabia and some, some other Gulf countries. And then we have a bunch of countries where they were already paying any Filipino domestic workers well above this wage, so this new regulation wouldn't affect them. This new regulation also didn't affect construction workers or, or other workers. So we have these two groups that we can compare the domestic helpers who are coming to low-wage countries to. We can compare domestic helpers in, coming to the UAE to domestic helpers going um, to countries where they were already paying them more than that. And we can also compare them to the construction workers go going to the UAE. So what we want to see is what happened when the Philippines passed that law to the opportunities and the, and the wages of domestic helpers. So what we find is that sure enough this law did increase the wages that domestic helpers got paid. So their wages rose between 27 and 46 percent in these countries. But it led to far fewer opportunities for Filipinos to work abroad. So the quantity of Filipino domestic workers fell 55 to 57 percent in terms of going to those, those countries. And so 
you know, the, this again, you know, these minimum wages do bind and they, they, it's not that employers can negotiate their way around them and so what's on paper shouldn't actually matter in practice. We see in, in practice this does matter, there's this big drop in terms of how many workers get to go abroad when you raise the, the wage that they must get paid. So this is perhaps the largest distortion in international markets. It's, it's that, that migrants are paid well above the market clearing wages. There's 700 million people around the world who would love to go and, and work abroad. And you know, we're, we're, there's so many regulations that, that limit how low you can pay these, wage, the, these workers that as a result, the wage gains to migrating are incredibly high, but not that many people get to do it. And the whole burden of adjustment comes through quantities, so when there's a crisis, suddenly all these people lose their jobs, not their wages changing. So what does this mean for development? Well, you know, let's think about these, these different types of rights. The, the development implications of income-based protection and non-income rights-based protection. So we can think about three different types of rights that all come out of that UN convention for um, the rights of migrant workers. So the first is this, this so-called right for migrants to be treated equally in terms of natives and in terms of what they've paid, the provisions of social benefits, the holidays, the, the wages, etc. Okay, so the, this existing evidence seems to think, suggest that there is a big trade-off between offering these rights and the opportunities for poor people from developing countries to actually increase their incomes through temporary migration. So the more of these rights you put in place, the fewer people get to migrate. Okay, so you, the ones that do get to migrate benefit a lot, obviously, but you know, if we do a, a back of the envelope calculation in the Philippines, you know, remember the wages went up, the quantities went down, overall the total income that went to Filipino domestic workers fell as a result of that. Okay, the elasticities were such that you know, the, more people lost their jobs than, than the people who remained had their incomes go up, so not only are there a lot of people that didn't benefit, but for the country as a whole, the Philippines now gets less income from domestic workers abroad than they did when they, when they hadn't put in place this opportunity. So, you know, there, there really is this, this trade-off in practice here between the, the rights that you are offering people in terms of these economic rights and the opportunities that they get to migrate. What about this sort of second set of rights, which are these rights to be able to uh, you know, remember the UN Convention said that there's this right that you get after five years you should be able to apply for any job in the country and you know, sort of path to citizenship is part of the lingo in the US and in the immigration debates. What about this right to change your status and eventually become a permanent citizen? So as I showed you in, in one of those graphs, the gains from permanent migration dramatically exceed the gains from temporary migration. So, Temporary migration has its drawbacks. You have to get separated from your family, so you're having to sort of pay for, for things in two different countries at, at once. You're, you have the utility um, loss of, of being separated from your family. You have to play, pay for pain, plane tickets. You have to um, you know, have that, all the startup costs of, of, of doing that in your country. And, so the, you know, the and also, as you stay on in a country, you can become more productive over time, and so your income gains you know, increase over time, and so being there for 10 years, you're going to be more productive than being there for, for one year. So the, the development benefits are more from permanent migration, both for, for the workers themselves and for the companies hiring them, but politically, obviously, this is very controversial, and so here, the, there's sort of no economic trade-off, but it seems like there's a political trade-off. There's, there's this trade-off between, you know, how many workers, citizens are prepared to let in, and allowing them the, these, these rights to, to things. And so in, in Martin Roos's um, book, he looks at 108 um, temporary worker programs and documents. There is this correlation between some of these types of rights. If you offer migrants unemployment benefits and things like that, countries that do that allow far fewer migrants to come in. And so again, this, this, this tends to come up particularly for low-skilled workers. For, for permanent workers, Typically, countries allow them more rights. They allow, I mean, for high-skilled workers, countries allow them more rights. They allow them more path to citizenship. And they're less politically controversial because everyone thinks that these high-skilled migrants are going to be you know, uh, taking less benefits and contributing more to taxes and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, typically are less of a, a concern. 
So then what about this final set of rights? And so this is sort of what you might say is a very narrow set of, of migrant rights. So far narrower than what the ILO or the UN is, is pushing in, the, in these conventions. But you know, basically rights to be free from abuse and exploitation and free to leave. Sort of some of the most fundamental of, of human rights. You know, retaining your passport, being able to depart whenever you want to, being able to leave an employer without their permission. These things that come up a lot in the discussion in, in some of the Gulf. Um, well, you know, these rights are things that failure to protect directly lowers the benefits of migration. So remember, our, you know, all our discussion is migration being well informed, be, knowing what these benefits are, being a, you know, everything being 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 a choice. If you're you know, getting abused and, and, and tricked and not able to leave, then this revealed preference argument doesn't apply. You know, the fact that I see somebody working there in that job, if they're not able to leave, doesn't mean that they're necessarily better off. And so, um, you know, the, these types of rights are ones that lower the development benefits and they're most costly for employers who want to abuse and who are going to, you know, have the least development benefits for workers anyway. So there's little economic rationale to not provide these rights. And there's also, you know, in, in most places, much less political pressure not to provide these rights too. And so, you know, this is the sense in which if there can be a, a much narrower version of migrant rights that there's, there's treaties for and engagements for, you could see a lot more buy-in, I think, for, for countries willing to sign on to sort of a narrow definition of migrant rights that at least provides these, these, these sort of very fundamental um, non-economic rights then, then is likely if you try and extend the version of rights to also include the rights to, to be treated exactly like citizens, to have permanent residence, to, ha to get uh, minimum wages, etc. So I've gone very fast and I'm done. <laughs>